Good afternoon, good evening to our esteemable audience, depending on where you are joining us from uh, today. And welcome to the Atlantic Council. We are honored to have a great panel to discuss a timely event. Uh, my name is Abbas Kadam. I am the director of the Iraq Initiative at the Atlantic Council in Washington, DC. And we are talking about the historic visit of Imam of Al-Azhar, uh, Sheikh Dr. Ahmed Al-Tayyib, who is making a visit to Iraq in the coming few days. Uh, a historic visit by all means, uh, and uh, that is coming uh, right after the uh, historic visit of uh, Pope Francis uh, to, uh, to Iraq. Um, this is an on-record uh, event. Uh, you are welcome to uh, tweet uh, what you uh, like from it using the hashtag AC Iraq. Um, and with me, a, a distinguished panel, um, Dr. Juan Cole, uh, Richard P. Mitchell Collegius, Professor of History at the University of Michigan, and uh, Imam Muhammad Majid, he's the executive Imam of all Dallas Area Muslim Society, Adams Center. <clears throat> and Dr. Marcin Ashimari, a research fellow uh, of the Middle East Initiative, Harvard um, Kennedy School. Thank you very much uh, for, for, again, for joining us um, to the panelists and to the audience. Uh, and uh, without further ado, we can start the, um, uh, the event. Uh, again, as I mentioned, this is a historic event. This is a historic visit that Iraq has not uh, seen uh, in our lifetime. And uh, Iraqis, uh, official Iraqis, and also uh, the Iraqi society uh, is uh, eagerly waiting for uh, seeing uh, the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar, uh, Dr. Ahmed Al-Tayyib in uh, Iraq. He will be visiting Baghdad, he will be visiting Najaf, and he will be visiting Mosul and Erbil, um, probably other uh, uh, provinces if time allows. Um, it will take Iraq away from the typical news of um, security problems, of conflict, of political bickering to uh, talk about positive uh, issues that we need to discuss and we need to witness, just like uh, the visit of Pope Francis put Iraq on the map uh, when uh, the talk was on the interfaith, uh, on uh, peace building, on positive um, sentiments uh, that are needed in the region. Uh, again, uh, this uh, visit will continue this work and we hope that we will see more visits and also more events like that. Uh, I will um, uh, start by asking um, uh, Imam um, Majid to tell us uh, what the Al-Azhar as an institution mean for, for uh, the Muslim uh, communities, uh, Al Azhar, as we know, is in the uh, heart of the Egyptian capital Cairo, but it is a symbol for Muslims around the world. What it means historically uh, in the current um, religious and, and political affairs, and also the significance of the personality and the position of its Grand Imam. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Abbas, for inviting me to be part of this wonderful uh, panel here. Um, uh, I would like to say that um, the Al-Azhar uh, has great impact in the Muslim world. Matter of fact, my father, my own father, Al-Azhar graduate, and uh, the, the sheikh who taught him, the scholar who taught him, Nim Shaltut, is the first person who included the Ja'far Madhab as part of the school of thought to be taught at Al-Azhar. And actually my father was exposed to that himself. Um, and he was a Maliki uh, a scholar that compared always Jafri Madhab, <coughs> excuse me, to Maliki Madhab. Al-Azhar have great impact by producing and graduating scholars around the Muslim world, from Indonesia to Malaysia, to 
uh, Nigeria, everywhere, that where you find somebody have one to Al-Azhar who really recognize as a, a Muslim scholar uh, in that country. Uh, the Grand Mufti, the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar is higher than the, even the Mufti of the country. Uh, he is in the level of prime minister <laughs> uh, in, in the constitution of, of Egypt. And it's a time, uh, lifetime appointment, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the grand uh, Imam of al Uh the, Dr. Al-Tayyib himself has been known uh, as a man of great charisma and great scholarship. And he is um, reaching out to uh, faith community around the world. And it's about time to see interfaith, R-A, because we have seen a lot of interfaith work right. being done around the world. And I think uh, for me, this is a uh, big news uh, to have the, uh, the grand Imam meet the great scholar Ayatollah Sistani, you know, uh, in, in, in Iraq. Thank you for this, uh, appreciate it. And um, let me uh, uh, start from where you ended and, and uh, ask, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Juan Cole, um, to uh, put us also in the same way uh, on, in the scene of how the Najaf uh, and, and Iraqi uh, uh, seminaries um, uh, have uh, represented the, the Shia communities and also how they uh, represented, in fact, just like al Azhar did, Islam in general, uh, and the role of, of this institution that has been in uh, continuous uh, operation since the year 1055 AD, um, uh, in the, since the middle of the 5th century, uh, 448 to be exact, uh, Hijri, uh, and also uh, the, the role of the um, uh, highest merger now, uh, Sayyid Ali Sistani. Yes, well, the, the Shia uh, branch of is Islam, of course, itself has branches, but we're talking now especially about the Twelver or Imami branch of Shiism, uh, which uh, believes that after the Prophet Muhammad, there were 12 uh, divinely guided figures. Uh, and on the disappearance of the, or the occultation of the 12th Imam, who is thought uh, to, to have disappeared from the eyes of human beings and will one day come back as Christians believe that Jesus uh, ascended and will one day return. On, on his uh, occultation or disappearance, um, the Shia community had to find its way forward without a, a divinely guided figure present amongst them. And they came up with various uh, attempts to reformulate religious authority. And the one that prevailed over time uh, was the uh, a school of jurisprudence that believed that the, the way to get the closest to the will of the absent uh, leader or imam uh, is to rely on the seminary trained clerics who have spent their lives familiarizing themselves with the sacred texts and the, the ways of reasoning through them to derive law. Uh, and so in this school of jurisprudence, which is called the Usuli school, um, lay people are encouraged to uh, choose the cleric that they think is the most upright and the, the most learned. And to follow that cleric's rulings on religious law, not necessarily on other issues, but on religious law, uh, uh, really unthinkingly, uh, without, uh, without doubt. Um, and uh, it's not allowed to shop around for the opinion you like. If once you choose somebody, you're kind of uh, supposed to stick with them. Uh, and, uh, and, and then, as you say, it, and it, 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 the custom grew up that the foremost scholar, recognized by his peers, because it was always a he, uh, recognized by his peers among the other clerics, and 
who found great popular acclaim would emerge as the leader of the Shia community religiously. And uh, so, so Najaf became the seat of religious authority in the medieval period uh, and into the modern period, uh, even though many more clerics you know, live in Iran than live in Iraq, and even though there are Shia in Lebanon and Pakistan and, uh, and so forth, nevertheless, Najaf has this primacy by, by long uh, custom and acknowledgement uh, and it's a, uh, I think for a Western audience to understand this institution of the, of the marja, or um, uh, I, I use the English word exemplar, uh, the, the person uh, who you're supposed to emulate, to, to be like them, to follow their religious opinions. Uh, the, it, it's, it's not like anything we have in the West. Because among Protestants, <clears throat> you can have a very popular preacher with many followers who maybe is a televangelist, for instance. But then that person likely wouldn't be respected by the seminarians, by the people in, in, you know, with, the, with the, the theological degrees and so forth. On the other hand, if you have a theological degree, you might be very well respected among academics, but not have a wide popular following. So the, the, the exemplar in Najaf combines in himself this wide popular acclaim and also the greatest respect among his own peers, uh, among other clerics. Uh, and uh, during the 20th century, uh, Najaf faced many uh, challenges uh, of the rise of Iraqi nationalism, which sometimes cut the Shia of Iraq off from, say, Iran, which had a different kind of nationalism. Uh, and then in the Saddam Hussein period, in the Ba'ath period uh, after 1968, uh, there were severe restrictions on uh, pilgrimage to Najaf, uh, and uh, Shia processions were forbidden, and the, uh, the uh, exemplar in, in Najaf on certain issues was constrained to, to really fall silent, at least in public, uh, or else, you know, risk a pogrom. And there were pogroms, and in 1991, uh, the regime attacked Najaf with helicopter gunships and, and, uh, and killed uh, many people and uh, many clerics died uh, and, and secret police swarmed the city because it had um, tried to throw off the Ba'ath regime uh, after, after the Gulf War. Uh, so Grand Ayatollah Sistani is a survivor. Uh, he's originally from Iran. He came to Najaf in 1951 and uh, his, his brilliance as a jurist uh, and his sensible judgment uh, as, a, as a moderate person catapulted him over time to the point where in the 1990s, he became that figure that uh, Shia around the world acknowledge as, as, the, uh, as their exemplar. Thank you, Dr. Cole, for this. And, and I would like to reinforce what you just said in the middle of your uh, statement, uh, why Najaf has that primacy that you uh, eloquently uh, stated. Uh, we also have to remember that uh, the, um, for a long time, the Shia seminary on Shia Marja'iya, the, the source of emulence uh, um, or emulation, uh, that uh, was mostly a, as you said, uh, it always rested on who the most learned, most upright person uh, in other words, this kind of reputation of piety and uh, knowledge were combined. And it's not necessary that this person always resides in Najaf. So uh, in the uh, prior to the establishment of Najaf uh, in, in the middle of the um, 11th century, uh, the school and the seat of the Shia authority continued to move from Qom to Baghdad to Najaf actually is when Sheikh Atusi moved to, to, to Najaf, he established the school. Uh, but after that, uh, while Najaf continued, we also witnessed centers of, uh, of learning. Uh, there was a time when Qom, time when uh, uh, Isfahan itself, uh, there was a time when Hilla uh, was then, and even um, uh, Lebanon in, in, in Jabal Ahmed was a time when you had that uh, learning Karbala, Samurra. Uh, in the turn of the, uh, this, the, the last century. So you really have those, but Najaf continued 
to be that uh, that place with its symbolism, the burial place of Ali ibn Abi Talib, the highest icon of Shiism. Uh, and and um, uh, if, if I were to um, turn to um, uh, my friend, Dr. Marcin Shimari, and, and you were in Iraq, I believe, when uh, Pope Francis visited uh, the, the country, and now you uh, are um, anticipating this another historic visit by another prominent figure uh, uh, visiting Iraq. Uh, first, I would like you to recall for us the atmosphere uh, that was uh, happening or, or dominating in Iraq when Pope Francis was there. Uh, the type of, uh, of, of debate, the type of hopes and uh, plans for the future to um, utilize uh, this visit and, and uh, benefit from the momentum it created and what this visit will, will mean also and how it can be compared and also what are the ways that you could keep this momentum uh, in, uh, in this interfaith and intrafaith as uh, Imam Majid uh, pointed correctly uh, in, in, in Iraq and also hopefully that it will go beyond the Iraqi borders to the, um, to the uh, religious communities elsewhere, not just Muslim, but really other religious communities as well. Thank you, Dr. Kaldum. Um, to be frank, I find myself incredibly lucky to be living through a time in which both the Pope and the Sheikh of Al-Azhar are both visiting Iraq and visiting Najaf in particular. And I say that because there was a period I was writing my dissertation on the Hausa in which people were somewhat uninterested in the institution, despite what I know to be, uh, I know it to be a very important institution and a very relevant actor in both politics and society in the region and internationally. So. Uh, it's one of the lucky turns in my life that it's so in, in the headlines now and there's so much attention to it. And I was lucky to be in Baghdad when the Pope visited Iraq. And I mean, you've seen it on television. I think it was covered extensively, but I, the reports are true. There was a lot of happiness, a lot of enthusiasm about the visit. And it wasn't just from a religious perspective. You have to think of it as coming from a political and from a religious perspective. And I think Dr. Kaldum alluded to this in the beginning of our talk. When the Pope came to Iraq, when he went to not only Baghdad, but also to Najaf and to, and to Mosul and to Erbil and to Nasriya, he was sending a signal. This happened amid a pandemic, of course, that Iraq can receive very high, uh, very influential, very important visitors and provide their security and have them have a great experience in the country, meet its people, its diverse populations. And it was, it was shown to be true that we could host this kind of event. And I think this is something that was heartwarming for a lot of Iraqis to see the fact that we could, you know, despite all else, we could pull this off. And as we saw, it's bringing forth more visitors that are equally important for us to engage with, um, including uh, the Sheikh of Al-Azhar, which is a very big deal in this kind of engagement. And this was from the political and from the security perspective. And I mean, if you, you could even go further and say from the political perspective, it's also about bringing in more important figures from the region. And we had some of these conferences happen and we had uh, the president of Egypt also happen. So there's this attempt to bring Iraq back into the region. And part of it is this religious aspect of bringing these influential religious leaders to engage with Iraq's most influen influential religious institution, the, the Merjaiya and the Hausa. But from a religious perspective, and the one that I actually care about a lot more, is that as much as these visits are very heartwarming and as much as they get us you know, very excited about the future of interfaith and intrafaith collaboration and dialogue, the fact is that they're happening for a reason. We've had a very difficult time in Iraq and in the region. We've just emerged from ISIS, which was um, an experience that really changed a lot of Iraqi society. Sometimes it resulted in the desectarianization of politics, for example. So it had lasting impacts on the population, but it also means that we have a lot to work on when it comes to interfaith collaboration, when it comes to dialogue, recognition of various religious groups and communities in Iraq, and the ability to work together as Iraqis across religious and sectarian divides. So there's a lot of work to be done. And Najaf, for years, because of having been under 
Ba'athism and under states in general that didn't want it to rise to any power at all. For years, it wasn't able to take on its natural position as the religious institution in the country, which would allow it to be a leader in interfaith and interfaith collaboration. And so this is all new to it. And seeing the Pope's visit and seeing this upcoming visit, this is just the step in the right direction, in my opinion, for Najaf, which is to take on this really important role that we really need as Iraqis. It's not just about the, you know, the good feelings and the, yes, we can manage security, but it's also a lot of our communities suffered in ways that are tied to religion. And we need to be able to have serious conversations about this. And we need to be able to protect them in the future and to also ensure that the name of, you know, individual religions that are practiced in Iraq are respected and aren't instrumentalized in any way. So uh, this was a long way to answer your question about the Pope's visit. And I, I mean, I have very high hopes for the future of Najaf in this arena. Well, it is, uh, thank you very much. It is an um, excellent uh, exposition of what we were looking for and from the question. And uh, someone like you who is in Iraq, who, and you did a lot of admirable work on the Hausa field work and also interviews, and you see it as it happens, and, and that's important uh, to provide a perspective from, from this angle. Um, and and uh, let me go back to uh, to Imam Majid and, and ask uh, the, uh, the the following uh, sort of follow up question. Uh, now, as Marcin mentioned, uh, it's it's really heartwarming to see an event like this happening. Uh, it is, uh, but but also we should not be uh, uh, forgetting, or we should not have the impression that this is something historic as a first dialogue or a first time these institutions talk. Um, uh, we, we really uh, must be sort of also reminding ourselves that uh, cooperation has always been there. You started in your statement by talking about uh, the uh, Sheikh Shaltut, who was a, a, uh, an important figure in the history of Al-Azhar and his position towards the Shia. You also um, you know, uh, basically, you 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 know, and I would like to probably you to to put us into the picture of what you know about Al Azhar in terms of how it embraces this this dialogue. Um, you know, with with um, students from Iraq and even from the rest of the the Shia communities elsewhere who go to Al Azhar and study. And uh, we have, by the way, I mean, people who are uh, well known in the cardinal Shia members or members of the Shia intellectual community. Someone like Sheikh Ahmed al Wa'ili. He had his doctorate degree from Al Azhar. Uh, and he is uh, he is the, the poster person for for uh, you know the, the Shia uh, uh, discourse. Uh, until he passed away um, a few years ago. Uh, so, uh, and there are many people uh, who go from uh, Iraq and from other countries to study there. So my question is, this visit, um, even though it's, uh, it is a continuation of, of these efforts, uh, but is it going to open doors because it is done at the highest level for uh, the two uh, communities, the two seminaries, the two schools, to open their doors for students and scholars from both uh, sides, and also to encourage uh, the respective communities to engage in this dialogue. I'm asking this because I know this is close to your heart. You are one of the most interfaith people invested that I know of. Uh, and uh, it is really um, uh, also, it's not just in Egypt, in Iraq, but also here in the diaspora and, and you know, places like the US, Europe, uh, where you, we will see more encouragement of these communities and leaderships and institutions to talk to one another and start a dialogue of understanding and embracing uh, one another. Uh, thank you so much. <clears throat> um, first of all, I would like to say I had the privilege and the honor to visit Iraq. And I visited uh, uh, Karbila, Marqad al Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. And I visited uh, Najaf, uh, Marqad al Imam Ali alayhi salam. And I had the privilege to meet Ayatollah Sistani two years and a half ago. 
for I, I've been in the presence of a man that is a very uh, actually moving and touching visit that I, uh, I experienced in my life. But I just want to say that up front, uh, um, you know, it is very important to have a dialogue in the top, trickle down to communities. Usually my challenge to the community in interfaith or interfaith, are we top heavy talking or what is the impact on this in the community? I, um, I was so moved when Ayatollah Sistani was asked about the Sunnah, the Sunnis in Iraq. He said, don't say, he said, don't say our brothers, the Sunni brothers. Say, say they are us. Um, um, fusana. That was a very, uh, for me, a, a changing, um, you know, discourse and helping people to understand the reality of the, to both community being one community. And uh, Imam uh, Ahmed al-Tayyib embody also that. But the challenge I have as an Imam, how can we uh, really make this the meta-narrative? not the counter narrative for this pluralization, pluralization between the both communities, the Sunnah and Shia. The meta narrative, it is where people believe in, within Islam, the different school of thoughts, like Al-Asr did. And we have gathered here in America, group of Imams from the Shia community and Sunni community. And we tell them you can ask any question to, any, <laughs> to, to one another. And you cannot imagine what happened in that room when the a Shia Imam leading the prayer and the Sunni praying by, behind the Imam and then the vice versa, it changed the whole atmosphere. And people left that gathering with a better understanding of both communities. There's misconceptions, uh, rumors, uh, uh, you know, a uh, kind of uh, uh, false belief about both communities, about one another for a long time. And when the Sunni, uh, imams as the Shia imams some questions and they answer them say oh we've been misinformed imams I'm talking about imams <laughs> we were Sharia graduate you know that is really what the problem is for my hope for this visit three things very quickly number one is to have exchange programs between the scholars of both institutions visiting the scholars number two training for imams and that's training done by both communities do not learn about shia uh, madhab as a sunni from a sunni learn it from a shia scholar we said that about the other faith we said don't learn about christianity from a muslim let's from the christian uh, scholar the same thing about the the um, the shia imams that they have to learn from the Sunni uh, perspective from the Sunni perspective. Uh, the third is youth movement. One of the biggest problems today facing us in the West is something called social media. The rhetoric is very bad from both communities. And we need to have people, popular figures in social media, part of the movement. Therefore, I wanted the Ayatollah Sistani beautiful message to be channeled in YouTube by other young people speaking about it, having people tweet about it, people to write articles about it, uh, people to engage people in a different platform of it, and the same thing about Imam of al -Assad. That's my hope for this visit, because I, I think uh, we need it as more, more than any other time that to have a real uh, uh, dialogue about hate speech. Thank you. Yes, dialogue and also utilizing this momentum because it is rare that we see people at the top level setting example and leading by example, telling their respective followers uh, that uh, we are um, talking and so should you. And, and that is important because people look up to these leaders uh, in their communities. Uh, they look uh, at them not just or uh, up to them not just for for 
learning their religious duties, but also a lot of this has to do with uh, with their entire human condition, um, whom they like, whom they dislike, uh, what kind of approach they take to the other um, communities, etc. Um, now, I must uh, mention uh, that uh, uh, our audience are welcome to utilize the question and answer uh, section in Zoom, and uh, we welcome your questions. Uh, if you put them there, I will be happy to uh, look at them and uh, include as many as possible to our esteemed uh, panel. Uh, and um, there is a, an icon at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A, and you could type your question there. I will see it in front of me. Uh, so let me, uh, I was going to ask uh, Professor Cole, and the answer came uh, nicely from uh, Imam uh, uh, Majid. So I am going to shift the question uh, to, or to another question. Um, Ambassador David Mack says something that is, um, I, I will quote it in full. He says, despite the efforts of efforts of some scholars uh, and uh, area specialists uh, in government service, I can testify that U.S. political leaders in Washington mostly ignored the role of Shia Islam in Iraq during the 20th century. This remained un true until the Middle East Journal published an article by Professor Cole in the autumn of 2003 issue. The article led to Juan's testimony in Congress and greater awareness of the religious and political role of Iraqi Shia in Najaf and elsewhere in Iraq. What are the remaining gaps? And that's the question I'm putting for uh, Dr. Paul. What are the remaining gaps in the understanding of the Biden administration and key members of Congress today? Uh, and also from me, uh, you know, a request of telling us about that, telling us about that article, if you, um, you know, like, and and how uh, it came that you wrote it. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Abbas. Uh, I, as you know, wrote my first book about uh, Shiite Islam as a transnational uh, movement between uh, Iraq and Iran and northern India in the 18th and 19th century. Right. Uh, and in order to do that, I had two chapters in my dissertation on Iraq, and I went to the biographical dictionaries of the great uh, clerics of uh, Najaf and Karbala. Uh, and of course, the Iranians and the Indians came on pilgrimage to the shrines uh, that Imam Majid talked about of, uh, of uh, Ali, the son-in-law and uh, um, first cousin of the Prophet Muhammad, whom Shia, who the Shia believe is, was his successor. Uh, and uh, so um, I developed a strong interest in the history of Iraq and of uh, its Shia movements out of my dissertation work. Uh, and so when the Iraq war uh, was announced by the Bush administration, it was clear that they were going to invade the country I became very alarmed because I could not see evidence that the US government officials uh, who were speaking in public about this uh, war uh, knew anything about Iraq. Uh, I mean, I don't think they probably even read a single book. And of course we did have some books about Iraq, some of them by very fine Iraqi scholars. Uh, and um, so, you know, at one point, Paul Wolfowitz, the deputy secretary of defense uh, said that uh, uh, he wanted to substitute Iraq for Saudi Arabia as a pillar of U.S. policy. He said Iraq would be a much better friend to the United States uh, than Saudi Arabia because uh, it, uh, Iraq was not a Wahhabi state and it didn't have that problem that Saudi Arabia had of the sensitivities around the uh, shrine cities of Mecca and Medina. So it became clear to me that Mr. Wolfowitz didn't know that Iraq had shrine cities or that they were, there were sensitivities around them. Uh, and in fact, uh, as the war was uh, beginning, uh, I, I was invited to Washington uh, uh, to National Defense uh, University to give a talk. And uh, there were some US military officers there. And I tried to impress upon them that they should be very careful not to conduct military operations in places like Najaf or Karbala, or, or it would have very severe consequences. So 
Once the U.S. was in Iraq, uh, I uh, wrote up what I knew about its contemporary Shia uh, movements and uh, I sent that article to the Middle East Journal, and they fast-tracked it and brought it out. Uh, and uh, actually, Joe Biden told me that he called me to s testify in front of the Senate uh, in 2004 because he had read that article. One of his staffers had given it to him. Uh, and so I have a high opinion of uh, Mr. Biden uh, uh, as a reader. Uh, I think uh, he's, he's better read than people assume that he is. And uh, uh, so um, that was my little role in all this. And there were people uh, at the National Defense University who uh, acclaimed me as the savior of Najaf uh, because I had, I had given that advice to the officers. Uh, but um, in the aftermath, the, the U.S., I think, initially didn't understand uh, the Shia community uh, or, or its position in Iraqi history, uh, and they... Uh, uh, just saw Muslims as monochrome. You know, they were thought Iraq is a Muslim country. Peter Galbraith, the former uh, ambassador in the Balkans who was uh, involved in uh, representing uh, especially Kurdish interests in Iraq, uh, said that he saw Bush before the invasion and uh, told Bush that, you know, there could be conflict between Sunnis and Shiites after the war because of reprisals and uh, bad feelings out of the 1991 events. And uh, Bush, uh, according to Galbraith, uh, said, oh, there, there are Shiites in Iraq. Uh, so that was a bad sign. Um, I think one of the problems, Abbas, if you want to talk about U.S. policy now, is that we finally managed to convince Washington that there are Sunnis and Shiites. And then now they have gone wild with this uh, division and they want to use it to explain everything in the Middle East. Oh, it's Sunni-Shia divide. Uh, and they, they're not aware of the strong um, ecumenical movements, both political and, and religious uh, that are in Iraq. Uh, uh, they, I think they were shocked when Muqtada Sadr, one of the Shia leaders, uh, uh, sent food trucks to Fallujah when the Americans were besieging it. Uh, Grand Ayatollah Sistani uh, did what he could to uh, stop sectarian violence uh, in 2006 and seven. In fact, for a while, announced he was withdrawing from making any political statements because people weren't listening to him. Uh, and it was something very dear to his heart to keep the Iraqis together. And it was one of the reasons that he supported Iraqi democracy so strongly. He, he was instrumental in influencing uh, the Shia and, 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 and other Iraqi politicians uh, to go along with a plan for parliamentary elections. Um, he's the one who insisted that the uh, elected uh, first parliament also be a congressional, uh, a, 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 a constitutional Congress and produce a constitution. Uh, and he gave interviews in which people said, well, you know, won't you end up with an Iran style state? And he said, no, Iraq is much more diverse than Iran. We have a big Sunni community, we have a big Kurdish community. It's impossible to have that kind of state in Iraq. And he clearly thought that a parliamentary democracy would, would be the vehicle which could unite Iraqis across these divides. Um, so the Americans, I think, have never quite understood the countervailing ecumenical impulses um, among Sunni and Shia in Iraq and, and the fact that Iraqis are first of all Iraqis. Uh, I, I don't know anybody who thinks that their subsidiary identities are more important uh, than the Iraqi nation, uh, and uh, they can identify the two, but I, I don't think they would make a preference for one or the other. And so I, now having finally convinced them that there are Shiites in Iraq, I think we have to try to convince Washington that that's not the most important thing. And if you think about the last uh, few years, uh, the big conflicts in the region, um, Saudi and, and Qatar, both Wahhabi states, uh, uh, got into it. Uh, and uh, th there are many examples of, of these kind, or or the Libyans managed to have a civil war, even though they're all Sunni Muslims. I mean, there are hard, there are a tiny number of bodies in the north, but almost all of the people who were fighting, they were they, they managed to find other grounds to fight uh, and divide themselves, even though they were monochrome. So uh, the Sunni Shia divide isn't the end all and be all. People are pragmatic. Um, 
And you see this in politics in the region all the time. Uh, Azerbaijan is a largely uh, Shia heritage country. Uh, it has conflicts with Christian Armenia. Iran supports Christian Armenia against Shia Azerbaijan. Uh, so you, you can't read off uh, politics from people's uh, religious ethnicity. And uh, I think it's very important for the United States to understand that in the post-ISIL period, Iraqis, as, as Marcin quite rightly said, you know, a lot of them are tired of the sectarian business and, and want to downplay it. And I think that uh, Sheikh Ahmed Atayeb's visit uh, it has to be seen partly in that context. Because both the Sunni and the Shia communities and their establishments have been challenged by this wild cult, uh, which excommunicates uh, other Muslims and, and oppresses them and uh, uh, has this um, uh, weird militant interpretation uh, of Islam. Uh, and uh, uh, Atayeb and, uh, and Grand Ayatollah Sistani, as, as leaders of Islam, uh, feel a responsibility to join forces, I think, in underlying the necessity for, for unity and harmony uh, across Muslim communities and, and for pushing back the ISIL kind of, of extremism. Uh, and I think that that's one uh, uh, undertone of this visit. Uh, Marcin, thank you, Dr. Cole. Um, uh, these are really uh, important points that you make and I hope uh, we will reflect on them. Uh, especially this idea that it is not always this divide uh, that has to be looked at in a compartmentalized way. Uh, you know, many of the examples you cited, I, you know, every time I go to Iraq and I go there very often, you know, you see uh, uh, Sunnis, for example, from Fallujah and the rest of Anbar, from Mosul, you know, tens of thousands of families went to Najaf and to Karbala and to the south, and they are still there since 2013, some of them 2014, even pr pr prior to ISIS uh, invasion. And uh, they've been lodged mostly by the Shia religious establishment uh, institutions, such as the Marja'iyya itself, also the Atabat, the shrines of Imam Ali, Imam Hussein, Imam uh, the, uh, Abbas, and all of the others who have their own resources, not governmental resources, but their own resources that are collected from the faithful, basically. And they use it to, uh, to, to uh, help those uh, unfortunate families that had to be driven out of their homes by violence a lot. And also, I must mention that uh, there is, uh, it's vice versa also. You can see similar uh, stories, not just anecdotes, but real stories of people risking their lives uh, from the Sunni community to, uh, to save lives of Shia and, you know, the, the story of those men who escaped ISIS from Salah al -Din and, you know, this woman uh, who really put herself, her, her children and her daughters and, and risk uh, and paid out of her own pocket to get these kids to their safety, the uh, Air Force cadets and many other stories like that. So there is a lot of that. And uh, since you mentioned Marcin's experience and what you just said, Marcin, um, let me ask you this, as, as a, um, a, a scholar who uh, has one foot in Iraq, one foot in the United States, uh, do a lot of work on, on these issues, especially the current affairs. Uh, I'm, I'm picking off what, what Dr. Cole just mentioned. How do you see these visits uh, fitting into the, uh, the, the new idea of uh, rising nationalism? Uh, something that is close to uh, what you comment on and what you work and um, in, in, um, in Iraq with the uh, new youth movement that is moving away from classical sectarian or ethno-sectarian affiliations and, and ethno-sectarian based politics to more of raising the Iraqi flag and chanting uh, nationalist slogans. And they are not just slogans, but they are becoming a way of life for these, these youth. Uh, and how can this, uh, this visit, the Pope's visit, and the new momentum we would like to see in Iraq and in the region fitting into uh, or, or helping this movement that is trying to create an Iraqi national identity? And I'm asking you here, both as a scholar uh, and, and, and someone who is working in Iraq, but also you worked with some of the leading uh, U.S. research institutions here in the, uh, in the country, in the United States. 
Thank you so much. That's an excellent question because as we were talking, I was thinking that I am the one who started the tone of high enthusiasm for this event. And then as we discussed it, I realized that we should temper it a bit because there's a few things on the ground that may evolve into different output than we hope for. And I mean, progress is very incremental. It's uh, That's something to be expected. But to answer your question about youth in Iraq, so there's two particular issues in Iraq right now that I think will play a role in how the future of peace building, the future of intra and interfaith dialogue will, will move on. And one of them is exactly what you spoke of, the youth. But the other one that I wanted to highlight, if you'd allow me, because I do think it's important, is the structure of Najaf and the Hausa itself and its own willingness to do this kind of um, these kind of activities. So one of the major differences between an Azhar and the Hausa and the Marja'iya is that Azhar is very institutionalized. It is an institution. It's very organized. It's clear with its positions. It's clear with the authority that comes with these positions. But the Hausa for a long time and the offices of the Marja'iya have a hierarchy, that's true, but they've been less of an institution in the very rigid Western sense that we know of. And Al-Azhar went through this transformation that it became very much like the typical modern university that we speak of today. And when I spoke to clerics in Najaf about this in particular, about the institutionalization of a religious system, they told me that this was actually one of their worst fears, that they really liked the structure of Najaf, the free-for-all that is, that is Najaf, and they wanted to preserve that. But one of the challenges that comes with preserving that is that different tasks fall to different people in an ad hoc manner and to different institutions within the major institution also in an ad hoc manner. So there will be some institutions who are devoted entirely to working on interfaith and intrafaith work. And I think we've seen this in Najaf for the past few years. There are clear offices in Najaf that have an interest in doing this. And I mean, uh, Grand Ayatollah Muhammad Sa'id al-Hakim who recently passed away, Allah he, uh, he his office was one of the ones that I thought had an interest, particularly with um, interfaith work. But that also means that a lot of the more senior, more powerful clerics will be very receptive, but their main interest will be to preserve Najaf itself. And so these things might fall to the sidelines or be relegated to other actors who are also important, but there isn't a universal uh, effort around this in Najaf and that will be a problem because part of working towards peace building and dialogue isn't just a person's um, activism as a cleric or as a scholar but it also depends on their willingness and ability to enact theological change or to create a theology or a doctrine around peace building or to you know to pull from whatever is in within Islam and to and to present that in a scholarly way and to create an institution that has peace building and dialogue as part of its as part of its uh, actual uh, foundation as part of its actual uh, doctrine so to temper our expectations i will say that this is one of the things that we should think about when we think about how najaf can play this role and personally i'm an optimist because i do see important clerics in najaf interested in this i but i just think the the structure of najaf which grants us so much um, advantages in some ways, because, for example, it's always been outside of the control of the state and Najaf has always prided itself on this. Um, so this structure gives us some advantages, but it also means that we'll be working with different actors. And so that's one of the challenges. The other one that you mentioned that I think is so correct is the youth in Iraq. So Iraqis are so young, as are you know, most of the population of the Middle East, the average age is 21 years old. And as we all know, the average age of a senior cleric in the Hausa is a few generations older than that. So there is naturally a disparity between what goes on in everyday life of youth and what what clerics identify as important. And one of the things we've witnessed in Iraq is that clerics actually haven't been able to identify with youth. And one of the trends that we've been seeing from public opinion research in Iraq is that there is a decrease in the trust that the Iraqi population has towards religious leaders. And so even if we had a religious leader that pushed this wonderful message, 
there's also going to be an issue of who is receptive to this. Now, one of the good things here, though, is that the Iraqi youth are also very clearly anti-sectarian. And I truly think this is one of the remarkable things about Iraq, is that it pushes against all the conventional wisdom of sectarianism that others have tried to, you know, claim about it. And I mean, Iraq's sectarian war was remarkably short compared to other civil wars. And there was an immediate reaction to these events of wanting to be anti-sectarian. And to be you know, genuinely quite honest with everyone, I grew up in the United States and I always said, I felt that the community in the United States was much more sectarian than my community in Iraq. And that's, you know, sometimes this is surprising, but to people who grew up here, they're like, no, it's actually not surprising. I can, you know, there's shared experiences this way. So I do think because youth are receptive to being anti-sectarianism, that despite their lack of faith in religious leaders that's been occurring over the last few years, despite this lack of faith, they may actually be willing to to listen more because of activities like these. But we will always be left with the challenge of how do you get such a large sprawling um, institution with various you know, actors and institutions, how do you get it to rally around a very important topic? Thank you, Dr. Marcin. Very interesting uh, uh, points and actually enlightening uh, because again, you, you bring observations that are firsthand and also you put a lot of thinking into what you observe uh, and and that's it matters really when we just combine the theory and what we see on the ground um and and let me shift a little bit and go back to imam uh, majid um and and ask you uh the, the visit itself of course we've been talking about in intrafaith uh, uh significance of it uh, talking about also the importance of the visit on Shia, Sunni, uh, mutual understanding relations, plans forward. But I would like to uh, also remind ourselves that uh, we are we, we know very well uh, that uh, if we look at the major Sunni schools uh, of, of jurisprudence, uh, you know, uh, you, if you uh, take the Maliki school out because Imam Malik was uh, uh, living in Medina and uh, he was associated with it. Uh, Abu Hanifa was, uh, uh, and, and he is the founder of the largest uh, school by fellowship uh, um, uh, in, in, in all times. He was an Iraqi and he lived and died in Iraq. Same thing with Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal. He's a Baghdadi by life and birth, and, uh, and he died and was buried there. Al Shafi'i, kind of really an international, if you will, figure. He started in Medina. He was a student of Imam Malik. Then he went to Baghdad and or to Iraq, and uh, he established himself as a Baghdadi uh, scholar or an Iraqi scholar. And then he moved to Cairo later on. Uh, so, in all of these, Iraq happened to be the. Um, uh, an important uh, place, uh, and and because of the importance of Baghdad and also the, uh, the the role of Iraq, but today, of course, we do not have a a, a center of or or a a leading center of learning in Iraq like Al Azhar, uh, like Al Qarawiyyin, for example, or Zaytuna, or even uh, in in uh, the the. Um, uh, centers in, in today's Mecca and Medina. So the visit of uh, Imam Ahmed al-Tayyib to Iraq and meeting with the Iraqi community, the Sunni community, the Sunni okay. scholars, uh, uh, we saw what the Pope did when he met with the Christians and it was really a great moral posting for, for their presence, it highlighted their, their presence, it gave them a chance to get their story and discourse out. What is the significance of this visit, a historic one, by one of the highest authorities, or arguably the highest authority in Sunni Islam, to the Sunni community uh, in Iraq, and also to the Sunni scholarship community in Iraq? Uh, I think it's very significant because you will find some of the Sunni scholars in Iraq that are Asar graduate. Yes. But he's meeting with some of the alumni of his own uh, uh, school. Um, the other things that I just want to say that 
the uh, you're right that most of the Muslim scholars from the Sunni uh, side and uh, they have visited Baghdad or Iraq for some time of their life. Um, but also you have Sufi scholars like Abdul Qadir Jailani. True. Uh, is, is the head of one of the largest Sufi order. Uh, uh, he is being buried in, in Iraq. Al Junaid al Baghdadi is being quoted by everybody from Nuthaymiya to Ibn al Qayyim to everybody else is, is agreed upon a scholar, a Sufi scholar, Junaid al Baghdadi. Uh, therefore, you have all of the, that heritage, Sunni heritage, also as well in, in, in Iraq, that uh, the Imam uh, Al Tayyib, uh, Grand Imam, will be able to connect. The, the 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 Sunni to that heritage, and I think that that would lead me to the issue of I- identity, and I think if both communities invest uh, invested in the history and the heritage of Iraq, and both of them celebrate the country as a place where the greatest scholarship have come from that country, and having Ahl al Bayt alayhim being buried there, uh, you know the Maraqid. I think that there will be a, a kind of uh, emerging of celebrating of history and some level uh, together. And I do believe that um, the uh, this may be part of the healing uh, process. Maybe, perhaps, um, uh, I don't like to be uh, too optimistic, <laughs> as Dr. Shepard is saying, but, uh, but maybe be part of the healing. I, I think maybe some of the scholars now in Iraq, Sunni and Shia, maybe some of them have not met, yet, you know, have not talked also as the way they're supposed to be engaging. Maybe there's an opportunity to create that kind of uh, momentum. I know that in Mecca recently, there's a group of Shia and Sunni uh, Iraqis met in Mecca. I heard of that. Um, but I think that um, Imam Tayyib being highly respected and in in the Sunni community, and his uh, his real scholarship is not questionable by majority Muslim scholars, uh, Sunni scholars. Um, I think that the 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 visit of having him to visit Ayatollah Sistani set strong signals that there is no way for us to continue this tension between the Shia and the Sunni, and perhaps that could be. Uh, uplifting to the Sunni scholars to see that the highest uh, Shia Marja'iya scholar uh, meeting the highest uh, Sunni scholar in, in, in Iraq. That, that's my hope. And my hope also, this is, will uh, translate here to the Iraqi uh, you know, communities, the Sunni and the Shia in America, because that may perhaps could be another opportunity for people to speak about this visit and what it means for both communities. Thank you. Um, and and uh, let me uh, ask a question. Um, uh, Muhammad Bakr Sadat, uh, just, uh, and this is to anybody in the panel, um, uh, I'm happy to, to get your views on this. After Sistani and after um, the uh, emerja'iyah lack, lack, uh, or lack of emerja'iyah like him, that's, you know, we, we don't know if, the next marja'i will be unlike Sistani, but even if we were to talk about that, what efforts uh, of Sistani, uh, Pope Francis, and uh, Sheikh Ahmed al Tayyib can continue or may ex- be expected to continue? Will that be the end of pluralism uh, via great marja'i uh, in, in Najaf? In other words, uh, I mean, I remember uh, writing uh, a, a piece of, of, uh, on, on the post Sistani. A um, uh, couple of pieces, actually, one with the, uh, my colleague at the Atlantic Council, Barbara Slavin, and another one with my colleague, uh, 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 Dr. Abdullah Arriba. Uh, this is a question, and these men are, uh, of course, uh, some of them are pushing 90 or past 90, and this is a reality of life. All of us are here today, and only the Lord knows who will be there tomorrow. So... In other words, I think the question by, by Muhammad would be, how can we make this effort not about people, but about institutions, and we guarantee its continuity? Anyone in the panel? Well, I, I think it's a, it's a really good question. Um, I, uh, 
I'm fairly certain uh, that uh, the emphasis on pluralism will continue uh, in the um, Marjai or uh, the, the top uh, religious authority in, uh, in Najaf. Um, this is the way they talk. They actually use the word in Arabic uh, pluralism, ta'adudiya, which I was a little bit surprised by, uh, Abbas, when I first saw the newspapers reporting some of their sermons, because it's a, um, a, a very you know, contemporary conception, and, uh, but they, uh, uh, the great uh, clerics uh, seem to have incorporated it into their theology. You know, it, it, it seems to me uh, that, that in some ways we've seen these swings more at Al-Azhar in recent times uh, than in Najaf because um, uh, uh, you know the the, um, the Sheikh uh, 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 Tayyib's uh, predecessor uh, uh, Sheikh Tantawi was also a pluralist uh, and um, supported uh, the uh, ruling of of 1958 uh, of Mahmoud Shaltut Shaltut on. Uh, the uh, um, legitimacy of the Shia branch of Islam uh, and of the Shia uh, uh, legal system. Uh, but in 2012, uh, the, the, the Muslim Brotherhood came to power in Egypt and put enormous pressure on al-Azhar. And uh, uh, for a while, uh, uh, people like uh, Sheikh Atayeb were were marginalized, and Al-Azhar gave two rulings against the Shia uh, and also published an anti-Shia book uh, before, uh, uh, and I'm not saying that the, the coup of 2013 was a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, I, I'm just saying that was when uh, Atayeb's star rose again and, and, uh, and this more ecumenical approach uh, started to become more prominent again in Al-Azhar. So within Al-Azhar itself, you know, there are people on the more Salafi Muslim Brotherhood side who have an animus against Shiism and who can come to the fore depending on what's happening in national politics. And then there are people like uh, uh, Atayeb, who is, by the way, a Sufi and uh, has, is the leader of a Sufi organization in Egypt. Uh, and I think some of the bases on which he'll be reaching out to the Iraqi Sunnis uh, and uh, including the Kurds uh, will be on that uh, basis of the importance of the Sufi mystical tradition and its traditions of tolerance uh, as opposed to, and he doesn't, he doesn't speak well of the more uh, hardline fundamentalist uh, tendencies in Sunni Islam. Okay, any other thought from the panelists or? Uh... I can jump in quickly on the yes, Najaf side and the issue of succession, which is something that comes up frequently. Um, one thing I can say with certainty from studying a century of, of Najaf and how elite clerics emerge is that despite the lack of it being a formal university like Al Azhar or many other places, uh, it still socializes clerics in particular ways. And so by the time you have reached a position where you could even be considered to be a candidate for this very high uh, position as, as the merja, you are already socialized into having certain practices and beliefs and the ways that you interact with politics and society. And so it's of no surprise that most grand ayatollahs actually behave in very similar ways when confronted with certain political issues like protest, uh, various you know issues when it comes to politics, revolutions, the like. And when it comes to interfaith work and intrafaith work, uh, you know, we have precedents in um in Shia and Najaf history specifically of, of interfaith uh, collaboration and work. And so I don't see any reason that this work would halt with the passing away of Grand Ayatollah Sistani, even more so because the institutions that are on good terms with Grand Ayatollah Sistani's office that operate in Najaf and pursue this kind of work are actually spearheaded by younger clerics as well. It's a group effort. It doesn't, um, it's, it's not just, you know, the one office of one cleric that does everything. And I think the fact that it is 
as a group effort. A lot of it spearheaded by younger scholars with the blessing of elite clerics. Uh, I think that bodes well for the future of this work. Thank you. Um, Sayyid uh, um, Muhammad Bakr Kashmiri, who represents uh, several mar uh, marja'iyas, uh, and um, including uh, Grand Ayatollah Sistani, uh, he leads the uh, uh, Imam Foundation, which is uh, working under the auspices of Grand Ayatollah Sistani. Uh, and, and his work here in North America is very well noted and, and appreciated. Uh, he asks a couple of questions to the panel. Uh, one of them is basically um, when uh, says that I, I would love to hear from the respected panelists, how can American Muslim community, especially youth, take lessons, invest, and benefit from the uh, upcoming historical visit of Imam of the Al-Azhar uh, to, to Najaf. Uh, what are the thoughts uh, that you have on an advice uh, that would be uh, given to them? And also, uh, how uh, can American Muslim religious leaders and Imams, uh, Sunni and Shia alike, take lessons from the meeting of Imam Al-Azhar and Najaf, uh, sorry, to Najaf, and present it in the uh, practical way to the American Muslim community. I think that would be well in the lane of Imam uh, uh, Majid on that one. Yeah. Um, first of all, I have great respect to Imam Kashmiri. I've been working with him uh, in the meeting that I was referring to earlier. His organization helped to facilitate bringing the uh, Imam from the Sunni and Shia community together uh, here in uh, United States. And also we had a declaration, Washington declaration, that um, given the respect to um, understanding within Islam, the diversity within Islam, unity within diversity or diversity within unity. Um, now, um, you know, the... Sometimes, you know, the impact of an event take place immediately. Sometimes it takes some times. Um, you know, always I remind people that when the founding fathers of, of the United States wrote the Constitution, some of them, they had slaves. You know, uh, and, but the impact later was on this document it have changed many people's lives. For I think that people who are not being listening, maybe adhering to this message of uh, Ayatollah Sistani and Imam Tayyip, eventually some people will adhere to it. And I do believe we have to start with the youth, uh, second generation Muslims in America. We need to invest on them. And I do believe that declaration remains just like a document until they being implemented. Uh, and as well, the impact of this visit and what it means, it has been translated to programs. And one of the things that maybe people should think about is a joint visit, that people can visit Al-Azhar and Cairo, young people, and then have people to come to visit Iraq, Sunni and Shu'i uh, youth, uh, you know, um, and learn from, you know, from uh, scholars on those places. That's one aspect. The second thing regarding uh, clergy and imams, I do believe that we have a problem still, I have to be honest, uh, with some people who uh, they uh, not really pro completely interfaith. They do interfaith very well, but interfaith, they're still they're hesitant. And um, well, for many reasons, and politics play a role into this whole issue, polarization through politics. And I do believe that with the effort that uh, the uh, Imam Kashmiri and the effort we made here in America, I think we made some change. And we, I'm hoping that to continue those programs and perhaps maybe a delegation from American Muslims, uh, scholars and imams to visit one, to visit Al-Asr, Al to thank the imam for this, and one to go to Najaf uh, to meet with Ayatollah Sistani to thank them for uh, this historical visit and collaboration. Any other comment or insight from 
Yes, uh, go ahead, Juan. Yeah, uh, well, I've been privileged to be called in uh, occasionally because I live near Dearborn uh, to consult with uh, Muslim clerics there because occasionally there are uh, these um, tensions uh, in, um, in the Muslim American community, especially when there's some big political event going on in the Middle East uh, on a Sunni and Shia basis. Uh, and um, what I tell them uh, when they make their inquiries as to how to tamp this down, uh, is that I'm a historian, so I, I, I know you are as well, Abbas, and, and we historians, you know, think in a strange way, you know, we don't think like ordinary people in some ways, because we're very attentive to context. Uh, a historical event has no meaning in and of itself. Uh, in fact, people used to write me when I was writing my blog about uh, Iraq in the old days, and uh, they would say, well, you give us a context that the press doesn't give us, so we don't know how to interpret an event unless you have context. So I always tell them that there's no such thing as an essential Sunni or an essential Shi'i or an essential conflict between the two. It's always embedded in a society, in a history, in economics, often uh, in political vacuums. And what political scientists think is that, you know, under certain circumstances, there are politicians who will try to mobilize people and gain political uh, capital by demonizing an other. I don't have to underline this point too much in today's America, where we see this phenomenon, unfortunately, uh, uh, becoming quite common. And those kinds of things did happen in Syria and Iraq and, and Lebanon and, and so forth. And, and, uh, uh, and then from the outside, it, it takes on this uh, aura of, you know, something essential, Sunni and Shia and so forth. And it's never, it's never the case. If you look in at the ex exact contours of the conflict, it, it's never essential. It's always contextual. And that's, uh, it's a tough thing to teach, I think, the youth and, and, uh, and, and educated laypersons, but it's, it's really something that needs to be uh, underlined. And, you know, uh, the American press does us no favors in the way that it, it configures these things. They kept saying that Iran was supporting the Ba'ath government in Syria because of Shiism. And I wanted to tear my hair out because, okay, so maybe there are a lot of Alawi Shi'is in the Ba'ath government in Syria. That's not why the Iranian government was supporting Syria. It needed a land bridge and it, it had strategic interests. And, 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 and they'd spent the previous 30 years denouncing the Ba'ath party in Syria and, and uh, attacking it as uh, godless and atheist and, and so forth. So th th there's this tendency just to read off uh, uh, politics from identity. And it's always a mistake. And, and then it has bad downstream consequences because people you know, become caught in that, in that trap of thinking that way. Well, thank you. And that partially answers uh, Joseph uh, Kotinsky's uh, question uh, who talked about um, the uh, house scholars, commentators on uh, religious leaders uh, try to um, um, under La, uh, or, or underestimate, if you will, uh, the uh, religious differences. He says, can we, should we strive to conceptualize notions of toleration and pluralism way, uh, in ways that celebrate rather than downplay religious differences? And, and that, I think, would probably merit a, a comment from, from Marcin on this. And also, since you, uh, and, and to tie it to and weave it into what you were just saying in your earlier question uh, or, or uh, statement about uh, Iraqi youth and, and Iraqi uh, changes in, in discourse. Um, in other words, should we really um, uh, celebrate that, that uh, religious uh, difference and consider it as a, uh, a, a point of strength uh, diversity is always, if you use right and if employed right, it can be a point of strength for a society. Uh, should we embrace it instead of just, uh, you know, maybe highlighting that it is not important and the differences are 
not really uh, what they seem like. And our clearly, you know, both discourses have their own tools and their own merits. I think we just heard from Dr. Juan Cole how eloquently you are just talking about these. Yes, differences exist. Yes, they play at certain times. And they don't play only in between the Shia and the Sunnis. We've seen it from, you know, uh, from Northern Ireland to, you know, here in the United States to many other countries to the Hutus and Tutsis and all of that and, and on, on ethnic uh, issues, not just religious. I mean, all of this idea of the other, and you know, you see people sometimes. All of them were were of the same religion, but they slaughter each other on the on on a um, on on a uh, moment of of lapse of judgment. Uh, but but the moment we also have to be mindful that at the same time where the Protestants and the Catholics in Northern Ireland were at each other's throats. The Catholics and Protestants live very amicably and in harmony in uh, Boston and in, uh, in New York and in Paris and in many other places. And they didn't kill each other. It's, uh, and when it came to solve the issue, they didn't decide to reconcile their Bibles. Uh, they basically went on the rosters of how many teachers from each side and how many city council men and council women and how wh what kind of jobs are being allocated. Once you sorted that out, uh, things got better. And this is the sil silver lining of it, because if it were about theology and religion, uh, then we are doomed to this fight until the day of judgment. So we are happy that these are episodic and they only are limited in scope only when other things, what Dr. Cole just mentioned, politics, uh, economics, uh, social issues, identity issues, they ignite them, but they can, you know, they, they are used to be um, uh, sort of the, 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 the uh, rallying cry, if you will. You know, if somebody goes in the streets of Baghdad and tell the Sunnis and Shia go and kill each other because I want to be a minister, not many people will go to the streets. But if he says these guys are going to change your identity, take your, uh, you know, destroy your shrines and do this and do that and take you over, then people, some people will listen. And, and that is, I think, it's a tactic uh, that is used only when the circumstances, political, social, economic, feed into it. Otherwise, it's not a, a starter. Uh, so, so Marcin, back to you uh, in, in that question. What is the way to go? Celebrate diversity or just undermine it and say, let's focus on what keeps us in common rather than what divides us. You know, how, how, what is the, the way that could work, especially in a context of places like Iraq and, and surrounding countries in the Middle East? I mean, it's a very difficult question, but, you know, as someone who's been an observer to peace building and interfaith and interfaith dialogue, uh, not a participant, but an observer, um, I will say that one thing it gets right is that it's not about shoving aside differences. It's about respecting others despite differences. And in Iraq's case, what we really need to empower is a sense of nationalism and citizenship of every individual Iraqi in order to allow them to live respectfully um, and peaceably with their with their neighbors. In Iraq, the repercussions of not having this have been huge. And I mean, we've been talking about Sunnis and Shias this entire time because of the nature of the visit. But the first visit, the Pope's visit, was a reminder to everyone that Iraq's Christian community is dwindling. I was speaking to an Assyrian friend the other day, and we were discussing uh, the future of Assyrians in Iraq. And we reached the conclusion that if nothing changed very quickly, there would be very few Assyrians left in the country, you know, the indigenous people of Iraq would be leaving Iraq and there'd be very few of them left in the next generation. And that's something really sad to hear as an Iraqi because you know, one of the things about Iraqi identity is that Iraq is a diverse country of many religions and peoples and nations, uh, and, and nations, essentially, that's the key part here, but they should coalesce around the concept of citizenship and respect, and that's what interfaith and interfaith dialogue is about, it's about building respect, letting people practice their own religions in a state where they are you know, at peace with themselves and with their neighbors. And in Iraq, we need this desperately because it wasn't so long ago that the Yazidis, who no one had, you know, if you asked any Iraqi, for the most part, generally, they wouldn't have even known who they were unless they lived in areas near them. 
they were just massacred and enslaved in a very quick you know, period of time with very little reaction. And not just that, you know, you would hope that after all this had happened, it would awaken something about citizenship and about respecting other members of your community. But to this day, I feel like there's been very little response, even from the Iraqi public. I mean, one of the things about the protest movement is that it protested so much about the Iraqi state and about corruption, but I haven't heard it once ask for the rights of minorities in Iraq and about protecting people who are indigenous people in, my, in, in refugee camps, minorities in refugee camps, you know, Iraqi citizens who have been in every way demeaned and their rights have been taken away from them. And it seems that as an Iraqi people, even the most active and politically uh, savvy of us still need, still have a lot to learn about what the, what Iraqi citizenship is. And, you know, I, I want to be very optimistic about these visits, about the Pope's visit and about Sheikh Ahmed al-Tayyib's visit. But I also want to stress that it's very much needed for us to, to protect uh, religious freedom and the ability to exist as an Iraqi peacefully in this country. So well, I'm not in the country now, but I mean in Iraq. So um, it, it should never be about erasing identities that were one or identity. It should just be about respect and living within within a state that respects nations and peoples. Indeed, uh, the Christians uh, in Iraq and also, as you mentioned, uh, and, and, and uh, the uh, Yazidis, but also another Iraqi minority that is really, um, their, their numbers are going down in, a, in an alarming way are the Mandaeans in Iraq, and, and they are a community that has been in Iraq. Uh, actually, Iraq is their their home. Uh, before many uh, other Iraqis have have gone to this uh, to this land, so uh, we need to have. And, and I applaud you for for mentioning this. We need to diversify our uh, our um, concerns and our demands uh, to uh, reflect this diversity of Iraqi communities. Uh, and, and that will help a lot uh, because some people need to have others adopt their, their cause and give them momentum. Uh, the, uh, uh, the other question is uh, I would like to, to uh, talk about uh, the, uh, with uh, Imam um, Majid on uh, this visit uh, by uh, Imam al uh, Kurt uh, uh, Worthmuller uh, is saying, uh, Sheikh Ahmed al tayyib has played an important role in the recent efforts by some regional states, uh, regional states to emphasize the concept of tolerance, including the United Arab Emirates and his own home country, Egypt. Uh, to what extent should we understand this visit as an indicative of bilateral religious dialogue among Shia and Sunni leaders? or as a component of the effort uh, to promote a particular state-centric vision of religious tolerance. It is not a zero-sum game, of course, but I'd like, he says, uh, he likes to see if uh, or to know what any uh, of the excellent speakers, and certainly we start with you, Imam Majid, think about uh, what is what are the dynamics at play here? In other words, is it a visit uh, that is from Imam al tayyib and Al-Azhar to uh, Iraq, including Najaf and, and uh, uh, Grand Ayatollah Sistani. Let's remember that the visit is not exclusively to Najaf, it will have Baghdad, Mosul, and Erbil. Uh, so is it that kind of thing, or is it in a larger context of uh, the, uh, the, the state-sponsored uh, tolerance uh, attitudes that are being uh, built up in the region. Uh, or I could think, be both. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think Imam uh, Imam Al Tayyib, Imam uh, Grand Imam Al Tayyib, he is uh, he is highly um, respected scholar, and I think he he does those things out of conviction. That's my really my understanding because I have seen him speaking his mind in many places. Um, um, therefore, I think that that's very important. Uh, but in the region, now Al Azhar been asked to play certain roles, like in the relationship between the Vatican and the Muslim world, in the uh, the document of the uh, human fraternity, for example. 
or the uh, having um, the Sheikh Al um, Sheikh Al Azhar played a big role in, within Egypt and in uh, this uh, document of uh, respecting minorities or citizens. Let's say citizens of other faith because they don't like to be called minority citizens of other faith in uh, in 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 Egypt by creating a document. I visited uh, the Grand Imam. Uh, a few years ago, about 10 years ago, and he uh, showed us uh, this document that had been created by Al-Asr called Bayt Al-Aila, uh, the document that talked about the Egyptian family, uh, uh, talking about the tolerance and understanding, maybe tolerance is not the best word, understanding and respect of, of uh, one another uh, as Christian Muslims in Egypt. I do believe that Imam al Azhar has, has Imam of the uh, Grand Imam has this, uh, you know, um, uh, important role uh, in the Muslim world that many countries, many countries in the region involve him in the issue of creating tolerance and understanding and so forth. Also has a global uh, impact in, in, in this issue by involving uh, Vatican and other institutions, global institutions. What I do believe that as is the, the imam, but it is going to impact, hopefully, the, the visit will impact the region. One thing I want just to say very quickly, politics. How much this will impact politics in Iraq? Uh, how much will impact politics in the region? Because some of the problem of, of the sectarian problem is a political problem. It's not a theological problem. And I hope that the politicians will then adhere to that, as you eloquently, Dr. Abbas, have said, that they use some of the politicians, use the sectarian divide for their own political gains. I hope this will put pressure on politicians in the region and in Iraq, a Sunni and Shia, to have their act together and not to use sectarian divide for political gains. Well said, thank you. Uh, now, uh, if there is any uh, uh, comment from the uh, esteemed panelists, other panelists on this question, um, whether it is a bilateral uh, visit, uh, an initiative from Al uh, Sheikh Al uh, Dr. Ahmed Al Tayyib and Al Azhar, or is it, uh, if not, in, in part of a, a larger uh, regional effort for tolerance, then at least it can dovetail into that. Well, Abbas, could I say that um, sure. uh, the uh, the initiative uh, for uh, um, uh, Imam Atayeb to visit I Iraq came from Iraq, and it's something that some Iraqis have been working on for a long time. Uh, and uh, the Speaker of Parliament, uh, uh, Mohammed Halbusi, uh, who uh, is from Anbar and, and formed uh, what he calls the Progressive Party, which is uh, explicitly uh, non-sectarian, uh, was one of the people who initiated this round of requests uh, that uh, Atayab come. And then Mustafa al Khadami, the, uh, the prime minister who's from a Shia background, uh, uh, also joined in with this request. So it is an ecumenical request for, on the Iraq side from both the Sunni and the Shia uh, politicians uh, that, uh, that this important Sunni figure should visit Iraq. And I know I went to Iraq in, in, in 2013 on a, um, a conference uh, because the Iraqi government was convinced that uh, it, it was time to open Baghdad and to have international conferences. Uh, and they were working on that. And unfortunately, you know, ISIL uh, uh, came and, and disrupted this process. But I think now a, a lot of uh, politicians in Iraq want to declare the country open. And I think inviting the Pope in, inviting Atayeb in, uh, is also symbolic, not only of this hope for greater ecumenism among Iraq's uh, religious communities, uh, but also to start putting Iraq on the world map as a place uh, where these kinds of visits and statements occur. Thank you. That's important. And thank you for highlighting this. It is really, um, again, in light of what we were just talking earlier, this is not a visit that just came out of the blue. Um, 
uh, or just surprised everyone. Uh, almost every Iraqi politician who goes and visits visits Cairo, including prime ministers and ministers of foreign affairs, etc., who go to Cairo uh, for political and state visits, they not make a point to stop at Al Azhar and uh, visit and talk uh, and take delegations with them. And in each visit, there is this. Uh, of course, uh, idea that you know, an invitation to the Sheikh al Azhar to visit Iraq, and uh, you know even the visits or the invitations were extended before Sheikh uh, Dr. Ahmed Al Tayyib, but also to uh, his predecessor, uh, Rahimahullah, and and uh, it didn't work out uh, because of of his health reasons. So yes, thank you, Dr. Paul. This is this is important to highlight as well. Marcin, any final thought? Oh, none for me. I just hope I didn't leave everyone very pessimistic today. <laughs> no, you did very well. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, we are exactly at uh, two minutes more. That's um, great to uh, point to to really um, uh, wrap up this this conversation. Uh, I am grateful to um, the the panelists uh, and and our friends, colleagues, and. Uh, people that uh, we always look up to, um, to their work and to their effort, uh, whether in the practical world or in the, in the academic uh, side of their work. And uh, it is such a great uh, contribution that uh, we received from all of you, great insights. Uh, and it is important to cover those issues. We tend to do a lot of events on politics and on uh, the, uh, the the day-to-day -day governance issues, but these are things that cut deeper than just politics. We did speak about the politics of it, but so also the social, the religious, the interfaith, and all of those issues that, in fact, sometimes I would argue that they are at the core of the challenges that a country like Iraq has uh, in, in many times that you, you really need to shed light on those. And also you need to celebrate and highlight the positive aspects that happen uh, along these lines. And this is this upcoming visit is certainly one of the really um, positive signs uh, and, and, and uh, things that give us hope. Uh, Dr. Akal, Imam Majid, uh, Dr. Al Shimmeri, I'm very grateful to you. Thank you very much. I would like to thank our audience and uh, for this. And also, I would like to thank uh, our team at the Atlantic Council, uh, including our Iraq Initiative team, and as well as the communications team that brought us uh, to you uh, via Zoom. And they put a lot of work on that, uh, particularly uh, my colleague, uh, Masoud Mustajabi. Thank you all. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you in uh, other meetings and other events. Uh, have a beautiful uh, evening and also wishing you and your families the best of health. Yeah, that's...